in the clouds, if the, if the heavens parted and the Messiah descended with the clouds of heaven, with trumpet calls, would you persecute him? Would you reject him? It makes no sense. Jesus reflected upon his situation. He foresaw that at the second advent, Christians awaiting his return may once more fix their gaze upon the sky as in the first advent based upon the prophecy of Daniel. Hence, they would be likely to persecute Christ at the second advent when he is born in the flesh and appears unexpectedly like a thief, just as the Jewish people did. If you're the Messiah, bring yourself down from that cross. Prove who you are. Show us your power. Demonstrate for us that you are the one that we should be waiting for. They would condemn him as a heretic in this new time, just as Jesus was condemned. That is why Jesus foretold that the Lord would suffer and be rejected by his generation. Now, this prophecy can only be fulfilled if Christ returns in the flesh. It cannot possibly come true if he comes on the clouds. And also, Jesus struggled in his own time to find any believer among the Jews faithful and zealous enough to follow him even to the point of death. Jesus grieved over this situation and lamented that something similar might happen upon his return. As in Luke 18.8, when Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now here again, why would Jesus ask that question? Will the Lord find faith when he comes? If the heavens would open and the Lord would descend, even the non-believers, even criminals, if every eye would see him, certainly that kind of cloud faith, a miraculous testimony, that's easy. Certainly. How could Jesus ask the question of whether he would find faith on earth? Jesus foresaw that at the second advent, the believers would be looking only toward heaven, thinking that Christ would return in the clouds of glory. Based upon this, he knew that when Christ does in fact return to the earth as a person of humble origins, he may not find any faith, as was precisely the case in Jesus' day. Luke's prophecy about whether the Son of Man can find faith on earth could never be fulfilled unless the returning Christ is born in a way that people don't expect, rather than descending from the clouds born on the earth, if he comes in a way that people are not expecting. Also, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. No. Jesus was saying on the day of my return, on that day, there'll be many faithful believers who are prophesying and doing many works and believing in the name of Jesus and ha even having the power to cast out demons, etc. And Jesus said, I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers, that people in the name of Jesus could stand opposing the providence of God. Why would Jesus speak as if he would reject such faithful Christians upon his return? At the second advent, those Christians who expect a miraculous and glorious appearance, who have plenty of cloud faith, will almost certainly reject him if he would come in the flesh from a humble birth. No matter how faithful they may be, the Lord would be left with no choice but to abandon them because they will have transgressed against God. This prophecy also could never come to fruition if Jesus would come in a miraculous way, and if we Christians would be in the same situation as the Jews thought they were 2,000 years ago, that I keep the Sabbath, I keep the sacraments of baptism and communion, I'm a faithful and believing and person, and I'm in the right denomination. I have my membership, I'm in the club. Therefore, when the Messiah comes, when Christ returns, He's coming to take me with Him. That's exactly what the people expected 2,000 years ago, and they were wrong. There are other 
biblical sayings which make clear that the kingdom of heaven and the coming of Christ couldn't be in a miraculous way with heavenly signs. Luke 17, 20, Jesus predicted about the end time. The kingdom is not coming with signs to be observed. In Luke 17, 21, for behold, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. It, 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 the kingdom of God is based on who we become. Resurrection is not the, the rising of physical bodies, but the resurrection of our spirits. It's based on our inward maturing and becoming true people. Likewise, Jesus said in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. It's the smallest of seeds, but it grows to be the greatest of shrubs. It starts from one tiny point, one person who fulfills the providence of God and the process of restoration. Likewise, <clears throat> Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, like yeast, which you place in one corner of the bread and it slowly spreads and raises the entire bread. In this way, the kingdom of heaven is to be realized as it was to be in the Garden of Eden. That's what the principle is telling us. Now, many would say, would look back at the people 2,000 years ago and feel that they were foolish for they were unaware of the clear prophecies. Many Christians today say there were clear prophecies in the Old Testament about His birth, about His coming from uh, uh, being born in Bethlehem, coming from Nazareth, and so many of the other events in His life. But see, we have the advantage of hindsight. The New Testament points to all those prophecies, is written in such a way to justify that Jesus is the Christ based on all of those historical prophecies. But in Jesus' own time, they couldn't see those things. They were only a few were aware of the prophecies. The majority of people with cloud faith were waiting for the Lord to come in a miraculous way as a mighty king or a heavenly appearance and lift them out of their misery and build the kingdom of heaven. Aren't we in the same position today? The New Testament also contains revelation. There's only one book of revelation about the end times, but there are references in the book of Revelation in Scripture that point to the possibility of Jesus coming, of Christ's return in a way that many do not expect. Let's take a look. Revelation 12.5 speaks of John's vision of things to come. And he sees a woman in the heavens and says she brought forth a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was in this future vision caught up to God and to his throne. Likewise, in Revelation 217, Jesus is speaking to the churches, giving 12 promises to the victorious believer who endures to the end. And in each of those 12 promises, Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. He's giving new information, challenging their traditional understanding. Among those promises, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who endures to the end, who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone, which represents Christ, with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. A new name, which no one knows whose name. Here in Revelation 3.12, another of the 12 promises. He who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the new Jerusalem, and my own new name. Likewise, Revelation 19, when John envisions the Messiah on a white horse, he who sat upon it is called faithful and true, and he has a name inscribed which no one knows but himself. Now this one with a new name, a name that no one knows who's riding on a white horse is the one who speaks the truth. From his mouth issues a sharp sword. And it's the one who, he's the one who rules the nations with a rod of iron as king of kings and lord of lords. So we can see in prophecy that we should reflect carefully on the meaning of these end times. Now, what can we learn from the divine principle about whether or not the Lord may come born on the earth? There are several reasons why Christ must return as an earthly man based on the principles we've studied. First, God created both the incorporeal or spiritual world and the corporeal or physical world. Then, God created human beings with the aspects of both spirit and flesh, intending for us to rule over both worlds as the fulfillment of His blessings. 
Therefore, as at the first advent, Christ must come as a human being in the flesh and grow to perfection, achieve dominion in both spirit and flesh. He must become that tree of life that Adam was to realize in the Garden of Eden. Then, by engrafting all humanity with himself, both spiritually and physically, he is to guide all to perfection, both in spirit and in flesh, to make us qualified to be the lords of creation, both spiritually and physically. He comes as that tree of life. So Christ, as at his second advent, is again responsible to build the kingdom of heaven on earth and become the true parent and king of all humanity. This is another reason why, as at his first coming, Christ at the second coming must be born on the earth. In order to fulfill the mission of Adam, who was meant to realize the kingdom of heaven. Remember that the kingdom of God from the very beginning was meant to be realized not by the heavens opening, not by anyone descending, not by miracles or power, but when the first true man grew to maturity, established a true loving family and dominion over all things, fulfilling the three blessings, that would have been the kingdom of heaven on earth. So in order to fulfill that mission of Adam, to realize the tree of life, which Adam was to achieve, but was blocked from achieving in Genesis 3.24, an angel with a flaming sword, a cherub, with the sword of truth, which blocked Adam's way. He lost access, pursued all throughout human history, the tree of life. And at the time of his return, the Lord appears in Revelation as the tree of life, the last Adam. First Corinthians calls him the last Adam. Romans says that Adam is the figure of him who was to come. Now, in order for the Lord to fulfill Adam's mission and realize the three blessings, he must be born on the earth. Likewise, the Lord comes to complete the work of salvation begun through the life and mission of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Now, the salvation which Jesus provided by the crucifixion is limited to the spiritual dimension. It does not resolve the original sin, which continues to be transmitted through the physical bodies of even the most faithful Christians and remains active in us. We still struggle in the flesh, Paul said, and wrestle between spirit and flesh. Therefore, to complete the work which was begun 2,000 years ago, Christ must come in the flesh to provide complete salvation, which includes physical salvation. He cannot achieve this if he comes only as a spirit from heaven above. This is the meaning of Romans 8.23 when it speaks about the meaning of being a Christian. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. Now, if all of this is true, what is then the meaning? of saying that Jesus will return on the clouds. What is the meaning of Christ's return? In Revelation, in Thessalonians and elsewhere, behold, he is coming with the clouds of heaven and every eye shall see him, etc. What can be the meaning of these biblical prophecies that the Lord will come on the clouds? To probe into this matter, we must first understand what clouds represent. What do clouds actually symbolize? Clouds are formed by the evaporation of water from the earth. In other words, water, when it vaporizes and rises to become a cloud, that's the relationship between water and clouds. Now, in the Bible, what does water symbolize? It often represents fallen people. For example, you remember in the story of Noah, when Noah, his family, and the animals entered the ark, built in three decks, and were bound up in the ark, and the rains came, and the ark remained until the waters were gone. The Bible says that Noah sent out, cast out, threw out a raven from the ark. And the raven was to fly about the earth until the waters were gone. The raven represents Satan. And so the waters on earth that would remain as long as Satan was there, and he, could, he was there until the waters were gone, represents evil dominion. Likewise, in Revelation 17, the Bible says, that a great harlot is sitting upon the waters. The harlot represents Satan. 
And the waters, Revelation says, the waters you saw are peoples and tongues and nations and multitudes, fallen people under the dominion of Satan. Now, when, a, when, when water resurrects, becomes a cloud, what does it leave behind? It leave behinds impurity. It leave behinds dirt, leaves behind dirt and corruption. We can deduce then that clouds symbolize the devout who have been raised from their fallen state, left behind their false and fallen nature, and resurrected to the point of having divine spirits and meeting the standard of the Lord. This is also the meaning of the rapture. It doesn't mean the physical defying of gravity of people on earth or dead bodies that have already been decomposed and been carried away by worms and eaten by fish and are probably, you know, part of this microphone by now will all of a sudden come back together and come alive or go up in the air. What it means is that we must be resurrected spiritually to the standard of the Messiah. Now, the Bible and other sacred scriptures also use the symbolism of clouds to indicate heavenly multitudes. As when Paul said in Hebrews 12:1, even now we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So we can conclude that Jesus coming on the cloud signifies that the Lord will emerge from among a group of resurrected and reborn believers. As when Jude 14 says that the Lord comes with his holy myriads. One more point. There's a reason why Jesus said purposely that the Lord would come with the clouds. Because if Jesus revealed plainly that he would return through a physical birth, then it would have been impossible to prevent false messiahs from causing great confusion. Anyone could claim to be the second advent. Anyone could say, I'm the return of Christ. I'm the one who's doing it. It's me and dazzle the world and deceive many and cause confusion. Fortunately, since most Christians have expected Christ to return in a miraculous way, their eyes have been focused on heaven, and this kind of turmoil and confusion has, to a great degree, been avoided. However, since the time is full, the truth that Christ will return through a physical birth 